Well, our sister already read the text, Psalm 142, uh, and I want to talk to you about our needs, everything we need. Um, and I'll tell you just a little bit about me um, to begin. Uh, so I am married. I have three kids. Um, I have a nine-year-old, almost ten-year-old, almost eight-year-old, and a one-and-a-half-year-old. And some of y'all were surprised by that age gap, and uh, so were we. We were also surprised. Uh, I love my kids. When, when I had my first son, Q, 10 years ago, um, yeah, it, was, it was an interesting experience to be a brand new father and to be very excited for a child. And, and it was a boy. And, you know, I'm named after my dad and my grandfather, so I got to pass that name down, all those fun things. Um, and one of the amazing things about him, when, especially when, you know, when he was real little, he was just a very happy baby. Just happy all the time. I don't, we don't talk about whether or not he's happy now as a 10-year-old. As a baby, he was very happy. Now, but um, really the only time he wasn't super happy was when we put him down uh, for a nap or for bedtime. And so when we, you know, would put him down for a nap or bedtime, he would lose his mind. He would cry as soon as we left the room. And, you know, for babies, you know, you don't know anything. A baby's hopes and dreams is like, maybe I'll be able to hold my head up one day. They don't know nothing. <laughs> and so when a, your parent leaves, it's like, oh, my goodness, we've been, I, I've been abandoned. They've abandoned me. They don't care about me. They've left me in this dark place. And so he would scream and, you know, we trying to let him cry it out. Uh, my wife wasn't as good as that as I was. I was like, he's fine. He'll be all right. Yeah. What well, amazing thing happened on one day, he found his hand, right? So he put his hand in his mouth, and as he put his hand in his mouth, it liked it, it's like it calmed him down. It was like he forgot about all of his troubles for a moment. It distracted him from the fact that, according to him, he had been completely abandoned, and from all the difficult things in his life, like sleepiness and a dirty diaper, all the really hard things kids go through. It was a self-soothing thing. Um, and it didn't actually change reality. He was still alone, but the, the, the self-soothing thing helped. Now, we have much bigger problems than that. We, we have much bigger problems than just being left alone in dark rooms. I don't know what's going on in everybody's life, but some of us maybe have come here today with those problems weighing on our shoulders. We have um, work problems. You know, we have family problems. We have uh, problems in some of our relationships. We have big things going on in our lives. Some of us have financial problems and, and things that weigh on us. And let me tell you this, when those problems begin to hit us and they're always circling all around us, when they begin to hit us, one of the things we'll be tempted to do is to find some kind of self-soothing thing to be able to cope with it to be able to distract us from the difficult things that are going on. And I just want to say, I, I want you to resist that temptation. And, and part of the, the reason is this, because, uh, you know, distraction is never a good solution to a real problem. In some ways, distraction can be worse because it doesn't actually deal with the, thing, with the problem itself. It just kind of helps you to pretend it's not there for a moment. And what I want to encourage uh, all of us in today is as believers in Jesus, when, when hard things come our way, we don't need coping mechanisms and false gods or self-soothing methods, right? We don't need something to make us forget. And, and the amazing thing what David's going to say in this passage is that we do have a lot of needs, but even in the midst of hard times, we can find everything that we need in God. Now, that may sound like I'm overstating that, that we can find everything we need in God. Because, you know, Christians like to say stuff that sounds nice and can, like, be put on a coffee mug in a very cute manner. But it's like, what does that even mean? What do you, what, what do you mean when you say God is enough, we have everything we need in God, when the world is crashing down around us? We'll talk about that a little bit. Psalm 142, to just give you a little bit of background, um, you know, David, when you, let me just say, some of those people read the Bible, they think they're about to enter a very happy place automatically, right? They think every passage you read, so, you know, some, a lot of us, when we first start reading the Bible, we was like, I just need some encouragement today, Lord. Uh -huh. And you may look down and it may say, I wish I was never born. And it's like, oh my goodness, that's not the pick-me-up I needed to start my day. 
But you'll find stuff like that in the Psalms all the time. If you think, if you're wondering, is God okay with us, us being honest about when we're having a hard time? If you read the scriptures, the answer is obviously yes, absolutely. So, so we don't want to have an idea that God can't handle that, right? So David's going through a hard time when he writes this. Just so you know, King David, one of the most famous people of all time, uh, most well known for his scrappy defeat of Goliath, a giant with a rock, um, defeats him, right? Um, he, he's very well known. And at this point, after that defeat of Goliath, Saul, who was the king at the time, um, is starting to have some issues with David because David is now very popular all of a sudden. And people are like, King Saul has slayed a few people. David has slayed tens upon thousands. And so Saul is like, hold on. I liked them at first. Now we got some issues. And so he says, okay, I'm going to kill him. And so they're pursuing him. David is running away. He's in a cave. And this is where he writes this psalm front. He is a war hero that's been turned into a fugitive and uh, he's trying to escape. And so that's where we are in this psalm. And I think one of the things David is going to show us that even in times of trouble, we can find everything we need in God. So we'll look at four things that God is to us in times of trial. That God is to us. And the first one is this. He is our friend. In hard times, God is our friend. You know, I'll read some of what David wrote there in that cave again. Verse 1, with my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. Okay, so if God is our friend, question for you, what's, one of the, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a friend? Right? Do you think of someone who likes the same stuff you do, that laughs at the stuff you do? Maybe someone you grew up with? Um that you have a lot in common with. One of the first things a lot of us think about is somebody who's there for us. You know, somebody says they're a friend and they know you're going through a hard time and you don't even hear from them. You ask yourself, are they really even my friend, right? There's something about someone being there and caring about what you're going through. The way that David prays in this text assumes that God cares and that he actually listens. David assumes that he has the kind of relationship with God that God is going to show up when he needs them. And when you think about it, it's kind of amazing that the God of the universe who holds the universe together by the word of his power, who's in charge of everything, would be tuned into the prayer of this little shepherd boy fugitive. And yet David seems to have a lot of confidence that God is listening. That God actually cares. Now, people who are skeptical about God may say, this is a nonsensical conversation. It doesn't matter who needs imaginary friends if your life is crumbling all around you. And I would say we can only say that if we don't really know who this God is. Because the fact that God is a friend of the God cares makes all the difference. Whether or not someone cares makes a difference between whether or not they actually respond to what you tell them about. Let me give you an example. Um, I, for a while... Um, I used to be weighed down with the affliction of being a Comcast customer <laughs> for both my internet and cable. It was a rough time in my life. And if you work for Comcast, I apologize, but do better, all right? Do better <laughs> as a company. Just playing. I'm not playing. So, so here's what would happen. Like, the service was fine sometimes, um, but as soon as something went wrong, then you got to call him. And I would always I would try to do anything but call him because when I answer the phone, it couldn't be more obvious that not only do they not care, but they also aren't really interested in pretending to care either. <laughs> Like sometimes it was very obvious, it was their first day reading the script, it was like, hello sir, thank you for sharing. Um, can you tell me more uh, about your pro excuse me, problem? It's like, you read him, bro, you don't even care about me. And so I, they'd be like, well, did you try turning your internet off? It was like, yes, I tried turning it off. Since the beginning of the electronics time, that's the first thing you try, I know. And, and then they'd be like, all right, well, I'm gonna have to pass you off to Leslie. And it's like, and then Leslie's like, did you try to turn it off? I was like, I just told him that I tried it. He's like, oh, I'm going to have to pass you off to David, right? And so 45 minutes later, um, you know, you're ready to throw your phone, your internet, your cable, everything out the window. But to them, here's the thing, they don't mind passing you off because it doesn't make a difference to them if my internet was helped. The, the various people I talked to on the phone, here's the difference. When you talk to somebody who cares about what you have to say, they feel driven to reply, to do something about the issue. 
David talks to God, not like he's talking to some random customer service reps who don't care about his situation, but as if he's talking to a friend who's interested and will do something about it. Um, someone who will sincerely try to fix the problem. So he's in urgent danger, life in jeopardy, running for his life. It's like he's in a burning building. I can imagine him just sweating and crying and weeping as he prays. He says, I cry out to the Lord, I plead for mercy. Pour out my complaint before him. He knows God is listening. Verse 6, he says, listen to my cry for I'm in desperate need. And what he's not, he's not saying, God, unlike how you normally don't listen, can you please listen to me this time? He's saying, no, no, I know the kind of God you are. All right, this is kind of how God's relationship with Israel even started um, as they're in slavery. And it says they cry out to the Lord and he hears their cry. And that's what leads God to deliver them. God listens. So this is David saying, look, you've promised to listen to your people. It's like he's tapping God on the shoulder and say, God, listen to your beloved. I have something to say and I know you care. He knew about God's track record and he expected God would hear him. I want to know when you pray, do you pray with this knowledge in mind? That God cares that he's actually listening. I mean, I, I know that there's some of us in this room right now who during this time as we've gathered and we've sung songs to God and prayed, that sometimes it's just kind of like an empty mindless just saying some words you see on the screen. You find yourself daydreaming. Because it's kind of, we don't really imagine God in the heavens listening and every word we're saying mattering to him. Or sometimes we pray and we're like, God, thank you for uh, food. Hope it, don't let it kill us. Amen. Right? It's like, is that how we would pray if God was sitting across the table looking us in the eyes? We often do not pray or interact as if there's a real God who cares and is listening to everything that we have to say. When we do understand that, it changes the way that we pray. If you're a parent, think about when your kids need something or they're hurt. The way that your heart instantly jumps to be helpful, that's God listening to us. And, and uh, one of the things we can learn from how David prays is he is honest about what's going on. He's airing his complaints to God, right? So <laughs> I don't want a God who, who is afraid of big complaints. Like we think if we really say what's going on, if, how we really feel, can God really hear us? Like if I really say, God, I just want to elbow my coworker in his neck. <laughs> We think that God is going to be like, you cut off, bro. That's it. <laughs> Lose my number, right? That's not what God is going to do. Now, he will call you to repentance if that's your particular prayer. But God can handle how we really feel. Now, God does tell us not to grumble and complain in Scripture. So how is it then that David is saying uh, he pours out his complaints before God? Let me just say this. David shows us the right way to voice our complaints. What God is telling Israel, what God rebukes Israel for is they're grumbling, complaining against God. They're like, God, why'd you bring us out here? We're hungry. We don't like it. How could you, right? They're, they're putting God on trial, his character, his works. Like, God, you're not all you said you were. David is not putting God's character or judgment in question. He does the opposite. I mean, even in this, he's like, I don't have this, but you're this. He's affirming God's goodness that God is the only one that can help him. It is not um, wrong to bring your complaints before God, especially when you're saying you're the one who can do something about it. It's like the difference between me calling the cops if my house gets robbed and saying, hey, someone robbed me, can y'all come help? Or me saying, hey, why did y'all rob my house, police? Well, one of them is accusing them. That would be wrong. Uh, the other one would be saying something wrong happened and you're the one who said you can do something about it. Can you come do something about it, please? There's a big difference between complaining, bringing your complaints to God or complaining against God. Um, there's a, uh, a rapper who said in this song called Dear God, he said about God, I think he's busy, hold the line please. Call me crazy, I thought maybe he could mind read. I thought maybe he could mind read. This, I think, captures a little bit of why we don't pray sometimes is we think like, oh, but why, why would I like bring up all my complaints to God if he's supposed to know everything? And part of the reason is this, because God likes to bless us in response to us asking him. God wants to hear from us. He doesn't just tolerate you bringing your burdens to him. He commands you to bring them to him. In fact, Jesus says, you see those burdens, those are mine. Give me that. You can't carry it. Not only are you too weak to carry it, I don't want you to try. Let me have that. David's pouring out his complaints before God, and God likes to respond to our prayers. 
One of the reasons we don't pray enough is because we don't think God really cares. Look what he says in verse 3. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. David is saying, everywhere I look, Saul is hiding different traps for me. Two times, Saul tried to kill David while he was playing a harp for him. If I was playing a harp for somebody, I'm like, bro, I worked hard on this. You don't know how to do this, do you? You see these fingers? <laughs> and he tries to kill him two times? Fool me once. Anyway, he tried to kill him twice while he was playing a harp. Tried to pin him to the wall. Just gave him his daughter's a wife to try to purposely set a trap. Tried to convince his son, Jonathan, who was David's best friend, to kill him. And so Saul, now his armies are chasing after David. There's danger at every turn. And we can relate to feeling like those seasons. So it's like everywhere I look, something else is going wrong. It's like no matter where I go, no matter who I talk to, something else is bad. And this is where David is. But he's saying when his spirit is faint, when he's weak, when he's overwhelmed, it's God who knows his way, um, who knows what he's going through. Verse 4, he says, look to the right and see. There's no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. David is saying he's alone. Right? He's uh, separated from his wife because he had to flee. Separated from his best friend, Jonathan. He's unwelcome in the kingdom. Feels like nobody cares about him. Nobody can save him. Yet he goes before God. David knows God is his friend. And God's listening. And, and I know I'm saying this a lot, but what a difference it makes when your friends have turned their back on you and your family has shunned you and your coworkers don't care about you or appreciate what you do. Your neighbors don't even know your name to know that the God in heaven who created everything knows you and cares for you. That he knows how many hairs are on your head. That he's listening to your prayers. He knows the pain and turmoil you're experiencing. God cares. And in this sense, the believer is never alone. I want that truth to sit on your souls. God cares. Whatever that thing is on your heart and mind that this is too much for me, I want you to know God cares. And that he's with you in that. We spend so much of our time trying to be noticed by other people, wanting their attention and their respect. We want them to care about us, but we can't always do it. But I want you to know God cares. There's no island or abandoned building, right, where, where, the, where, where we can get away from him. So David is so alone. It's not like he can send somebody a text message. Nobody knows where he is or what's going on. He can't drop a pin for someone to come get him. I want you to know there's nowhere remote enough where the cell service is bad enough that God doesn't know where you are and is not with you. God is a friend and he cares. And as the family of God, this is how we should be with each other. Like, like, I want you to know what's going on with your brothers and sisters in Jesus. Like, that's the kind of community and family we want to be as, as believers. So, this, this is David saying, like, I don't have any friends. You're my friend. You care. So, first, he's our friend. Number two, God is our protection. God's everything. Uh, we can find everything we need in God. He's our friend. Number two, he is our protection. Y'all still with me? What's the first thing you do if someone throws something at you, right? You, you put your hands up to protect yourself if your reflexes are fast enough. And the reason is because, you, you know, something's coming at you. It can harm you. You want to put something in between yourself and that thing that can harm you. David is saying, um, God is our protection. God can be that thing. Um, he says, I have no refuge. All right, that's what he says in verse 4. Now, when we hear the word refuge, we automatically go to this metaphorical sense. Like he's talking. that We think he just means he has nowhere to run to, no one to run to. But that's not what he means. He means, I have no home. I don't have anywhere to lay my head. I don't, I don't have any shelter. I have nowhere to sleep. He couldn't book an Airbnb or go to a hotel. He didn't have those options, which is why he's hiding out in a cave. So, when we talk about we can find everything we need in God, can God be a house for us? I don't understand. This is what he says in verse 5. He says, I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. So he said, I don't have a friend, God, but you're my friend. No one listens to me. You listen. I don't have a caregiver. You take care of me. Now he's saying, I don't have shelter, but you're my shelter. And this is another thing that could sound cute on a coffee cup, but I want to know what that means for God to be our refuge. Because obviously he's not saying God is a literal, literal physical shelter, but he's saying 
in this season, when I don't have a physical, literal shelter, that God is another kind of shelter for him. That God is his refuge. That, that he's the protection from the things that threaten us on the outside world. Um, so, you know, even though we in our homes have, you know, often try to make homes little heavens where everything is perfect, you know, try to make the kind of home that the, the, the HGTV, that the Property Brothers will be proud of if they were to show up. You know, that's the kind of homes people off the way, they have all the entertainment. Some of y'all knock down some perfectly good kitchens, like just in case the Property Brothers show up, I want them to be proud of me. <laughs> And that's how we think of home, these perfect little places that have all this stuff. Um, the main purpose, though, of a home, of a shelter, is protection from what's happening in the outside world, protection from storms, protection from thieves, protections from anything that would harm us. David is not saying, God, you are my kitchen that the Property Brothers would like. He's saying, God, you are my protection from everything happening in the outside world. Psalm 57, 1, he says, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings, I find refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. He's saying while these storms are coming, I'm going to hide in God at the deepest part of who he is. That's where he finds safety. I, I want to ask you, is God your refuge today? Right? Where, where do you run when you feel unsafe? What is that? This is one of the ways we can know, you know, what's going on in our hearts. What if it was taken away from you? Would you, would all your sense of safety and security go away? When other things are taken away, what do you run to? It, it could be our job. It often is. Financial security. Sometimes it's like everything could be going wrong, but as long as I know I can pay my bills, that's what gives me my sense of safety and security. I, I, I want us to strive for what David is calling us to here, that God being our refuge would be where our heart is. Because it's a trust in God um, as our protection. It's knowing we're safe in him. David's life is in danger. Don't get me wrong. He's distressed, but he feels safe. And that is a strange place to be that we see in Scripture. And I, I, I just want to say this. Nowhere in the Bible does God promise that nothing bad will happen to you. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, just follow. So if someone told you, follow God, and, and you, God won't let anything bad happen to you, they lied to you. And it's one of the most destructive lies because then when bad things happen, you're going to say, God, what happened to that deal we had? And God will say, I never had a deal like that with you. Here's what God promises, though. Um, here's an example. Like, my, my watch right here is waterproof, all right? So, you know, what that doesn't mean is if it's storming outside, that my watch isn't going to get wet. It doesn't mean if I jump in a pool with this on, my watch isn't going to get wet. I wouldn't jump in a pool because I can't swim, but that's another story. <laughs> what it means is even though it gets wet, it won't be destroyed. It means it's built in such a way where it can endure water. So, so this, is what, this is what God's going to say to us. God is not saying, I won't let any danger come your way. Nothing bad will ever happen to you. God is saying, I will sustain you in that. God is saying, I will protect you even in the midst of that. And not only that, this is part of what's amazing. God has said, all the things that come your way, I'm so powerful, I can turn those things for good. So all the things that are meant to destroy you, you'll actually be more like me on the other side, that you'll be better on the other side of that. And, and that's part of the protection of God that we can take delight in, is that even the things that come for us that are meant to destroy us only make us more like what we were made to be. What a promise, what a security we have in that, in God, that nothing is stronger than him. And he knows how to turn those things for our good and for his glory. So I want you to think about where you run in troubled times. Sometimes we run to fake shelters, and those are dangerous. They lie to us. Sometimes fake shelters, they, they convince us that they can protect us from stuff, but in the end, they only leave us more exposed. They won't really protect us from destruction. So, you know, that could be, um, it could be your finances, it could be addictions, it could be sex, it could be porn. Whatever kind of things that we run to that make us feel safe, I just want you to know those fake shelters is like, you know, taking shelter in a cardboard box in a hurricane. Maybe at first it'll keep you dry, but you're really just setting yourself up for failure because they can't do what they promised they will do. It's not a good place for us to run. Those can even be good things that we run to. Um, the, the last thing I'll say here while we're talking about God being our protection is not to buy into the lie that you should just wait until the hard times hit to make God your refuge. 
Once a storm is already hit, it's a bad time to start building your house. Right? Once you get into a fight, it's a bad time to start boxing training. And you're trying to do too much at the same time. Now, I don't say that to say if you haven't made God your refuge and hard times hit, because sometimes we'll feel bad like, God, I'm coming to you now, but only because I have to. I should have come to you before. And I just want you to know, though we should make God our refuge right now, whether we're in good times or not, when those hard times come, do not feel ashamed of running back to the God who's commanded you to do exactly that. Sometimes God brings us to the end of ourselves where we literally have nothing else we can pretend can, can fill that role that only he can fill so that we'll be forced to call on the only one who can do it. Uh, so don't be ashamed if you find yourself in that place. But my encouragement is to make God your refuge now. In, in hard times, we can find everything we need in God. God is our friend. God is our protection. Number three, God is our treasure. God is our treasure. I'm going to read verse five again. David says this. He says, I cry to you, O Lord. You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. He, David calls God his portion. A portion just means a share. So it could mean uh, your share of an inheritance. Uh, your portion of it that was left behind, it could be a reward that's rightfully yours. David is saying, I have nothing. He don't have a bank account he can withdraw from. He didn't bring a treasure chest he was dragging behind him. He doesn't have anything. So he's saying, I don't have a portion, inheritance, reward, or sharing anything, but God, you are my reward. You are my everything. I have you, though. Um, uh, a few years ago, my wife and I watched a documentary on ESPN called Broke. And it was about these professional athletes who made millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars and then went completely broke trying to figure out how to pay the bills. And it was really heartbreaking to watch because they worked hard, they did amazing things, were getting paid well for it, but it didn't end well for them in the end for different reasons. Could be bad decisions, bad things that happened, unexpected things. But one of the things that made me think is there's just no amount of money that you can say, okay, now it's safe for me to just build my life on this. This is part of why scripture is like, hey, don't store up rewards on earth where the thief can break in and steal them. And, Something can burn your house down and natural disasters can happen. He said, why don't you build up a reward somewhere where it can't be touched? I, I just want to encourage you that, you know, especially in a time like this where, you know, uh, some of us can be going through hard financial times. Inflation, I mean, I, I remember just a couple months ago being like, hmm, seems like my money is disappearing more quickly than it used to. It's like, oh, maybe it's because I used to call $7 to fill my car, but now it costs $7,000 <laughs> to fill my car. Maybe that's the issue. But here's the thing, like, there's so much stuff like that that is completely out of our control. We do not have control over that stuff. But what we do know is it can be fickle, that it does this. And our joy cannot go up and down with the stock market. Our joy cannot go up and down with the value of the dollar. We need something more stable than that to build our life on. You know, Paul the Apostle said that, you know, I could be, I've been rich or poor and I found the secret of contentment. You know, the secret that he found where he was okay being rich or poor, it was Jesus. Because he was like, no matter how poor I am, I still have Jesus. No matter how rich I am, I still have Jesus. And there is nothing, there is no recession, there is no inflation that can take away Jesus. Amen. David says, I don't have anything, but I do have you. Uh, A.W. Tozer said, the man who has God for his treasure has all things in one. Our joy can't be based on our bank accounts. Um, and so when I say we can find everything we need in God, I'm not saying we don't need money or we don't need shelter. Don't put that on Twitter. Uh, Christians don't need houses, triple E. Don't put that on there. I didn't say that. <laughs> what I am saying is, this is not a, I'm not calling you to neglect your other needs, but I am saying we should depend more on our greatest need, God himself. And when we're lacking those other needs, we should know that we have a God who's strong enough to be with us in the midst of it. Even at a time like this when that's kind of hard to process. And David even says, he, God is this portion in the land of the living. Sometimes we think, my portion right now is all this money and all this other security. And later, God will be great for me. That's the reward I'll get later. David says, no, no, right now, God is my portion. Right now, God is my reward. He's my everything. 
So even, you know, when we're lacking, we can find everything that we need in God. God is our friend, our protection, our treasure, and lastly, he's our deliverer. Number four, he's our deliverer. Um, superhero movies are obviously a big deal. Uh, they have been for a while, and I like, I like superhero movies, but not as much as some of y'all. Um, I, can't, I, I can't keep getting excited, I gotta be honest. Like, they, just too many. It's too, yeah, they bring our superheroes, no one even, we didn't ask for that. What, you could have left him in the comic books, bro. I didn't, I didn't Ant-Man, I, come on. Ant-Man, no thank you. Uh, they're bringing out all kinds of extra people, but we like superheroes because we, we like that kind of story where there is an evil villain that seems like they cannot be defeated, but then there's someone who has strength that's even stronger. There are people who are desperate in desperate need and someone can swoop in. Even if it's not superheroes, if it's like, you know, Liam Neeson and Taken is like, I got some skills, bro, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you with these skills. And we like to watch him get him with them skills. That's, we enjoy watching that. And David is talking about God in this way, like, hey, there are some things that are bigger than me, that are stronger than me, that I could never defeat on my own, but I do know a deliverer who could swoop in and do something about it. Uh, verse 6, he says, listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me. Why? For they are too strong for me. One of the reasons some of us don't pray is because we never acknowledge that something is too strong for us. We are very uncomfortable being weak. We like superhero stories. When we think about them, we like to be the superhero in our stories. We don't want to be the person in distress. If you think you're strong enough to deal with everything on your own, I want you to, say, I want you to know you're lying to yourself. So the quicker you get over that illusion, you'll be able to live in reality. And all of us convince ourselves of that. But he says, they're too strong for me. Again, he's telling God how he feels. I'm in desperate need. But David knows this God. He's seen his track record. He's, he knows he can do the impossible, right? God has already been with him in amazing ways. God is, you know, uh, has given bears and giants and armies into his hand. So this one self-obsessed king chasing him, he knows God is strong enough to deal with that. And he's desperate enough to call out to God. And I want you to pay attention that, that David also is asking God for mercy. David's not asking God as if he's entitled to it. Some of us think God owes us something. I want to remind you, God owes you absolutely nothing. Every single thing you've been given from God is a mercy. You've been given it not because you deserve it, but because God is good. God delights and he gives us stuff not because he would be in our debt, but because he's good and he delights to give and he's generous and kind and loving. And that's how David asks. He's asking for mercy, even as he asks for deliverance. And he's in a desperate place. Um, one thing that just as a friend is hard sometimes is when you have friends who are in a desperate place because things are going really bad. You know, it's one thing to be in that desperate place yourself, which we all find ourselves in. I found myself in that place more in these last five, six years than I had in the rest of my life. But when you're trying to help friends in that place, sometimes they can be like, I don't even know what to say. You don't just be like, it'll be okay. Like I have one friend who, it seemed like every other month, something new was happening to him that I couldn't even imagine going through. What am I supposed to say? How can I even help? And I think one of the ways we can help friends in that place is to help them get to where David is right here. The kind of desperation says, I know I'm at the end of myself. And so I gotta give all of this to the only one I know who can do something about it. Psalm 50, 15, they, uh, says, call up, God says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. God keeps showing himself as a deliverer over and over again. Last verse, verse 7. David says, set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. This is one of the reasons David wants to be delivered so that he can praise God for his deliverance and everyone can gather around him. This is what we're doing here. Everyone is gathering around praising God for amazing deliverance. And one of our problems is sometimes we ask God for particular deliverance, he delivers us, and then we move on like nothing happened. That's one of the reasons we don't have a lot of track record to look back on when we're in distress because we forgot all the times God has done exactly what he says he does. You know, when I was a little kid, I loved Christmas. I mean, all kids love Christmas because you're a little kid. All you really got is like nap time, Cheerios, and Christmas. So you, you hold on to what you have. 
And I just, I, you know, I'm asking for this big wheel all year. Let me get this big wheel. Please, can I get a big wheel? Y'all never give me cool stuff. <laughs> and so I got the big wheel. And what if I went to school the next week and my friends were like, hey, bro, did you get anything for Christmas? I was like, I don't even remember. I think I got some socks. Now, wouldn't that be strange when, I, when my parents say, hey, you asked for this this whole time, and you, I finally gave it to you, and you acted as if nothing has ever happened. And this is what we do to God all the time. When was the last time you reached out to somebody, not just to say, hey, can you pray for me? I need this. But I had this desperate need, and I asked God to meet it, and he did. Can you praise God with me for his amazing grace? I want to encourage you to figure out what it's going to take for you not to forget all the times that God shows up to be exactly who he says he is. I want you to reach out to people just to say, look at what God has done so that we can have these moments like David is saying where everyone gathers to praise God for his goodness. When I look at this, you know, David crying out to God and finding everything he needs in God. This prayer that is, you know, has this urgency and this distress reminds me of another prayer that we see in Scripture. Somebody related to David, and his name is Jesus. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is praying with urgency and distress, and he pleads with God. He wants to be delivered from the pain ahead of him. And, of course, he wasn't. It was part of God's plan for delivering us. But like David, Jesus poured out his complaint. So much he was sweating blood. Like David, Jesus had traps hidden for him in his path, right? Judas led his enemies to him. Judas kissed him on the cheek so they would know which one it was. And he was betrayed. And like David, um, uh, Jesus was pursued by his enemies. They were chasing him. They were bloodthirsty. They wanted to kill him. Like David, Jesus was threatening all these little kingdoms of men around him, but also like David, he was God's chosen king. Like David, Jesus was left alone without his friends. Jesus was abandoned by his friends. They left. The same dude they, they saw feed 5,000 with a few fish and loaves, they left. They said, Jesus, I'll never leave you. They left. Jesus was left alone even at his worst moment. But unlike David, Jesus didn't ultimately flee from his enemy. Unlike David, Jesus was killed in that situation. He was captured and he was killed. Unlike David, he knew when he came into the world that he would die this way. And he did it on purpose. Unlike David, who did eventually die, but David stayed dead. But unlike David, Jesus got up from the grave. Unlike David, uh, him dying could not hold him down. And unlike David, Jesus didn't stop being king after his death. In fact, Jesus resurrected it. It only made his reign more clear and evident. One of the unique things about the death of Jesus, unlike any other king or any other person, is that Jesus was victorious through his death. And, and the, one of the things about this passage is it keeps showing us all these things we can't do for ourselves, and I need to call out to God for that. This is um, not only true for hard times we go through. This is also true for our relationship with God, for our souls, for our eternity. Because um, the same way David's like, we don't have any friends. God, you're my friend. I don't have a place to stay. God, you're my place to stay. I want you to notice we have no righteousness before God. Jesus is our righteousness, though. We don't have perfect holiness before God. Jesus is our perfect holiness. We cannot defeat sin on our own. Jesus is our victory over sin. We cannot defeat death. Jesus is our victory over death. Jesus is saying, here I am. I'm a deliverer. Call on me. We, our sin has put us in a place where God was separated from him. Um, and maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. Or you're not really sure where you are. I, I just want you to know that Jesus is holding out himself to you as a deliverer and saying, let me do the heavy lifting. Let me deliver you. Um, it's good news from God. And this fits in with God's character. When I was a real little kid, I, um, I trusted my parents so much that anything was going on, I just wanted to find them. I knew they could fix it. So just let me find my parents. And uh, my prayer is that we would have that same childlike faith in every area of our lives. Let me pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. 
God, I don't know where everybody is this morning. I don't know what's going on in their lives. I don't know what kind of hardships there are, what kind of difficulties, Father. But we do know we have a God who's stronger than all of them. I don't know how big the obstacles are, but we do know there's a God who's bigger than those obstacles. So, Father, we pray that um, you would drive us to call on you. God, I, I, um, I, I pray you would help us to see that you delight in that. And Father, for, for my friends in the room who are not sure where they are with Jesus, I pray you'd show them the glory of Jesus, our deliverer, show them how amazing he is. We got my brothers and sisters who do know you, help us to see him more clearly. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.